we're very comfortable in saying that we see that the deer are comfortable being away from each other and all the deer don't want to go to one place at one time. You know, they have social issues and we literally see them, you know, fighting in the food plots. And if somebody's watching one food plot, we'll have a certain group of does come up to that food plot and a whole different group comes down to a different food plot. So while the the plots aren't that far away from each other, we're really liking that we're giving them the different taste, just like humans when eat different things during the day, because they might have different needs at different times in the year, you know, that the different nutrition is going to come through the brassicas and that blend versus the clovers and let the deer tell you what food plot they want to hit at what time. Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast, episode number 278, Joe Godar, The Hunting Junkies. Support for the Big Buck Registry and the Deer Hunt Podcast comes from Rackology, Everything you need in one bag. Now available at Rural King and Orsland Farm and Home storefronts or online at www.rackology.org. Minus 33 Merino Wool Layering System. Timeless natural insulation, keeping you warm on the coldest days while staying breathable and wicking away moisture on the wet ones without the old school itch of regular wool. Grizzly Ears, the most advanced engineered wireless earbuds for the outdoors. Covert scouting cameras, remote cameras for hunting, wildlife, and security. Quiet Cat, the all-terrain electric bicycle. Visit quietcat.com, that's Q-U-I-E-T-K-A-T.com, and use the discount code BIGBUCK15 to secure 15% off your next Quiet Cat purchase. And Big Buck merch. You can get cool, high-quality Big Buck t-shirts, long-sleeve t-shirts, and hoodies and show support for this podcast by visiting www.bigbuckregistry.com forward slash M-E-R-C-H. Big Buck Registry is a virtual museum of hunting stories. We preserve a piece of Americana by interviewing and recording hunters about their hunts and experiences from across the country. And who knows, maybe we'll learn a thing or two along the way that'll help us take our hunt to the next level. This is Brandon Adams with Major League Bowhunter, and you are about to listen to the Big Buck Registry Deer Hunting Podcast. Hey, this is J.C. Hall from On the Road and Open Season TV, and you're listening to one of my favorite podcasts, the Big Buck Registry. This is Zach Farinball with The Hunting Public. And you're about to listen to one of my favorite podcasts, Big Buck Registry. Hello, ladies and gentlemen and fellow predators. My name is Jay, and thank you for tuning in to the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. For Dusty Phillips and Jim Keller and the entire staff here at the Big Buck Registry, welcome to this week's show. There are a couple things I'd like you to do for us if you could. If you would, please check us out on iTunes, subscribe, and leave us a review. With your help, we're going to try and push this show up the iTunes charts. I know we have a lot of listeners out there, and I need you to take some action. I need you to leave a review and subscribe to the show. If you do subscribe, that'll give you access and notification each and every week that a new show is released. You can also access this show in its entirety on YouTube, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Google Play, and as an Amazon Alexa skill. Go to Alexa and say, Alexa, enable Big Buck Registry. It's all right there for you to access on demand at your fingertips. Regarding the harness program, we have an ample supply of harnesses to give away from our volunteer donors. If you're in need of a full body harness, please send an email to j at bigbuckregistry.com. It's a story that starts 120 years ago with a small hunting cabin in southern Ohio. For Joe Godar, a member of the group called Hunting Junkies, it's a home away from home, now with a new cabin on the same 50 acre parcel filled with numerous food plots and tree stand locations to hunt any wind. We discussed Joe's plan for a 12-month cycle of food sources, dual planting times during the year, one-at-a-time arrow practice shots, and how to eliminate target panic early in the season. We'll get to our entire interview with Joe Godar in just one moment, but before we do, let's hear from our friends at Rackology, Minus 33 Merino Wool Products, and Jim Keller with the Deer News. (laughs) 
Hey, it's Eric Fitzgerald here with Rackology. I wanted to visit you briefly about one of the most exciting products that we got in the market with Rackology. This is our food plot fertilizer. You can supplement your deer right through your food plot with this product. This is not your normal MPK. This has got so many goodies in this bag. Basically what it does is it makes your soil work for you so you can get by with just using fertilizer like this and not a lot of synthetics. If you want a good food plot and you want deer coming in and healthy, healthy plants, look at the food plot fertilizer through Rackology. Check us out at rackology.org. Thanks for tuning in. Let's talk about a hunter's layering system for a sec. We need to be ready for any weather that Mother Nature throws at us. With the layering concepts that Minus 33 has created with their incredible Merino wool products, they've got you covered. The Minus 33's Merino wool Expedition Weight Garments will keep you warm on the coldest late season days while regulating and wicking away moisture in a way that only Merino wool can do. You see, wool will absorb up to 30% of its weight and moisture without leaving you feeling wet or clammy, and wool insulates better than cotton or polyester and protects against hypothermia on those late season hunts. And here's another interesting point. You might not think of wool for early season, but with the Minus 33 wicking technology, I'll take a lightweight Minus 33 base layer any day in warm weather. Merino wool fibers naturally reject any bacteria found in moisture or sweat and gives you double protection against odor as your target buck approaches. Visit www.minus33.com to learn more about Minus 33's layering technology. Use the code BIGBUCK33 to get 10% off your next order. Now here's Jim Keller with the deer news. Our first story this week, what deer hunters should know about the EPA's latest review of glyphosate. This story is from the Quality Deer Management website and is reported by Lindsay Thomas Jr. The Environmental Protection Agency recently completed a required periodic review of glyphosate's registration as a legal pesticide and the product survived the process. Glyphosate remains legal and, according to the EPA, safe when used by the label guidelines. However, the EPA is recommending a few adjustments to the label that some of its critics may appreciate. After an exhaustive review of available international research, convening of expert panels, and a thorough weight of the evidence review, the EPA continues to find that glyphosate is not likely to be carcinogenic to humans, nor did it identify non-cancer health concerns when glyphosate is used according to the label. New assessments did identify potential risks for mammals and birds. Where food potters and deer habitat managers are concerned, the potential health risks or level of concern for mammals and birds feeding on plants treated with glyphosate was primarily for spot treatment mix rates rather than the lesser mix rates used on larger applications of the herbicide. The other area of potential risk identified by the EPA is the review of spray drift, glyphosate being carried by the wind away from its target areas into bordering vegetation. The EPA admitted that pollinators, including bees and monarch butterflies, are harmed when important plants, like milkweed for monarchs, are killed by drifting glyphosate. In the broader world of agriculture and forestry beyond food plots, is glyphosate being overapplied or misused? Yes, one confirmed result of overreliance is glyphosate-resistant weeds, which QDMA has warned against. But addressing worldwide misuse of the herbicide goes beyond the scope of QDMA's mission. Where deer and deer hunters are concerned, glyphosate is safe for use by habitat managers when they follow the label. Angry Deer Chases Man Confronts Cop and Barking Dogs This story is from the Bring Me the News website and was reported by Joe Nelson. Like a bar drunk, a deer in northern Minnesota was picking fights with anyone who looked at it the wrong way. True story, according to the Eli Police Department. At around 9 p.m. Wednesday, Officer Brad Roy was patrolling a residential street on the west side of town when he saw that a man walking his dog had a deer stalker as they were being chased down the street by the indignant animal. Roy got out of his squad car and yelled at the deer, prompting it to stop for a moment before continuing its effort to run down the dog walker. Officer Roy yelled again, having no idea how the Jane Doe would react and in doing so became the new target for her ire. Caught like a deer in the headlights, Officer Roy was saved from a chasing of his own by two dogs across the street who started barking. Eager for a scrap, the deer ran across the street and started pounding its hoof against the fence separating it from the dogs. The Minnesota DNR was called by Officer Roy who learned that the deer was likely the mother of a nearby newborn fawn. Officer Roy gave the deer a verbal warning and she was sent on her way. Seriously though, the DNR says a doe with a fawn may be aggressive and protective. People and pets should be kept away from them. Fawns are typically born mid-May through early June, so there are plenty of protective mamas out there right now. 
Man claims his dog is bribed with deer bones by a garbage-loving bear. This story is from the Fox News website, was reported by Janine Puhak. One Canadian man claims that his guard dog is in cahoots with a local black bear, with the bear allegedly giving the dog deer bones to munch on in exchange for full access to the household trash. Though the dog owner has not yet witnessed this strange exchange, he has shared his suspicions on Twitter in a series of posts that have gone massively viral online. On May 8th, Jesse Jordan took to Twitter to discuss his dog Brickleberry's troubling new habits of accepting late-night snacks from a hungry wild animal. Jordan shared images of his Mastiff, Hound, and the Beagle mix looking unbearably happy with his gifted deer bones and the mess of trash the bear evidently left behind. In posts that has since earned 323,000 likes, 82,000 shares, and over 2,000 comments. The man went on to detail that he raised Brickleberry, otherwise known as Brick, by hand as the pup's mom passed away soon after he was born and that the pooch is great with kids and apparently with bears. Responding to commenters who voiced concern for the dog's safety, Jordan insisted that his large dog was safe outside as bears are a nuisance in northern Ontario and not typically a threat. As for the suspicions, the pet parents told people they realized something was awry when he spotted Brick chewing on a mysterious bone he didn't buy for him and a mess in his yard. While the father of three has not yet caught the bear making mayhem, the news comes as no surprise through the spring season. This time of year, black bears are notorious for raiding trash bins, camp, cottages, orchards, Jordan dished, literally anything that smells like food. Commenters, meanwhile, had a whole lot to say about the hilarious allegations. The dog is simply being paid what the market will bear, one joked. One might call that the arf of the deal, another one cracked. That concludes this week's edition of the Big Buck Groceries Deer News. Special thanks to Daniel Applebaum and John Geis for leads on stories this week. For the links to the stories featured this week, please check our show notes at www.bigbuckregistry. If you have any ideas for future topics or have any questions about any of these topics, please email me at jim at bigbuckregistry.com. For the Big Buck Registry, this is Jim Keller with the Deer News. Well, thanks to Jim Keller for the Deer News. Without further ado, here is Joe Godar from the Hunting Junkies. Joe Godar, welcome to the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. How are you, my friend? Good, Jay. Thanks for having me on. We're psyched to uh, learn more about you and hunting junkies. Awesome. Well, we're, we're glad to be here, and anytime we get to talk hunting, we'll, we'll take that opportunity. I have to admit, you know, through our Common Connection Rackology, uh, the sponsor of the show, and I believe the sponsor of yours as well. That's correct. You know, I'm always searching for content that's out there, and hunting junkies kept coming up. I'm like, who are these guys? Pretty cool. You know, you're doing food plots, you're clearly into hunting, and I decided to kind of go behind the scenes of hunting junkies and find out a little bit more about who you are, and and because you're, you're definitely in the same mindset of me and our all of our listeners. So I thought uh, it was time to find out what hunting junkies is all about. Well, that that's a great question. It, it's a it's a 120-year-old story, and it's a brand new story, all, all, right. all in the same. Very cool. I. I have to give uh, a lot of the credit to my uh, nephew, Corey. Um, So we've had uh, a a property in our family since the 1800s. And for us, this was, it's just like very, um, it's like emotional. It's historic. Um, You know, when I grew up, it was, you know, my great uncle George's property. It was a little cabin out in Southern Ohio. And we went out there on the weekends and we would just go, we'd take our BB guns and our fishing poles and we'd go up the creeks and, We'd fish and we'd run and hunt and just do anything that we could since the day we could walk. And this is back, for me, back in the 60s and 70s. And as time went on, I initially got into fishing more than hunting. Okay. And I kind of admit I'm guilty of getting, like, compulsive with things. So, you know, (laughs) I was fishing the creeks one day and then I'm fishing the lakes and then I get a boat and then I'm fishing, you know, the FLW tournaments all over the country. And you know, I just absolutely love the outdoors. And as I started a family myself and just kept going back to our property, the property finally made its way and was uh, deeded to myself and my brother. Um, We decided we wanted to spend more time at this place. So we tore down the old hundred year old shack and we built a a modern, you know, uh, log cabin with running water and bathrooms Mm -hmm. and everything. And so we just kept going out to this property more and more. And then as the fishing career was butting heads with my family, um, I couldn't really take off, you know, three times a month and be gone four or five days with, you know, children running around. It became much easier to 
take my family to the cabin and sneak in hunting trips as they're sleeping. And so hunting kind of took over fishing for me. Gotcha. All right. And then some property came available near our cabin from a local lady that I know. And so about 15, 20 years ago, I decided to buy more property that is very close and doesn't quite abut our property, but it's right next to it. And I just kind of dove into the whitetail hunting world and started managing and developing that. And then as my uh, nephew got old enough, I remember his very first hunting trip out there with us. We started filming it, so we had records of all this. And he he missed a six-point buck the very first night that we came in, and it's something we just tease him about to this day. But his interest came along, and he started looking into you know developing web pages and uh, we're in marketing for our vacation rental business, so doing stuff to start marketing hunting was almost like something we had to do and we started putting in food plots and then putting posts on Facebook and before you know it, we got people like Rackology talking to us about, hey, put our food plot in your place if you're going to put that on Facebook and out of that, Corey kind of developed and launched huntingjunkie.com and it's just been coming along the last couple of years through that birth. Gotcha. All right. So you don't have, um, were you a hunter as a kid? Did you, did you have a mentor or was it, this is a late, late life kind of transition? Um, I fished more than I hunted when I was a kid. We okay. would go rabbit hunting, uh, squirrel hunting, uh, duck hunting occasionally. Um, but we fished all the time and the, the fishing, um, it was just, I still love it to this day. I just don't have time for it. And that's why when I was in my, you know, twenties, I married, um, you know, I had the bass boats and start doing the local tournaments that led to the national tournaments. And I had a little bit of success. So got some sponsors and did all that. Um, and then it just doesn't work with a family. And all my fishing buddies were like, well, you got a deer hunt. You can deer hunt in your backyard. And, and where we live in the Cincinnati area, we physically can deer hunt in our backyard. So I could work and come home at four o'clock, hunt for two hours and come in for dinner. And I didn't have to leave my family for the weekend to deer hunt. And so it fit for my family, you know, raising kids that I could sneak out to deer hunt and be in the middle of some unbelievable deer hunting in Ohio. And so that just, my passion just switched over to that. Gotcha. Where is home? I know it's Ohio, but where, where do you, where do you call home overall? I, overall, I live in uh, Cleves, Ohio, which is the west side of Cincinnati. And then our, our family cabin is about an hour and a half uh, east of here, like in south central Ohio. Okay. So you picked a pretty darn good state to deer hunt in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We, we would always travel to Texas to fish. I would go down to Lake Fork, and that's where I caught the biggest bass I've ever caught. And people, as we're sitting around, you know, at the local restaurants, would want to come hunt in Ohio because we had the big deer. So, yeah, it, it's nice to have something that is just naturally here, and I just was born and raised here. So yeah, we're very, very fortunate for that. Very cool. The, um, I mean, what's your overall view of hunting in Ohio? Is that mostly where you, you do most of your hunting? It is. Um, I've hunted elsewhere in some of the other states, but... 90% of the time or even more, I'm, you know, pretty much just hunting our property or some local property around. If I don't make it out to my property for the weekend, I have spots around my house that I can get out and hunt. It's, you know, it's like urban hunting. It's a hundred acres packed in between a community and it's just full of whitetail. Okay. I want to get into in a, in a few minutes about, you know, when deer season starts for you and how you, how you kind of manage a, a 12 month cycle. I mean, we'll get into that in a sec. You know, sure. As far as like hunting junkies is concerned, now that it's been established for a couple of years, what's what's the purpose? What's the goal? The first purpose probably is for us to have fun. And we we work so hard in our normal jobs, and uh, Corey, my nephew, works with me. And like I said, we do marketing for vacation rentals. So for him and I to work, you know, side by side all week, and then to jump in the trucks and go out to the hunting property on the weekend. Um, it's very easy for us to, to bring the cameras and the drones and the pictures and the things that we do for our vacation rental business and then just document what we're doing. So we, we want to keep it that we're interested in it and we know there's a business there and it kind of developed into a, a little bit of a business, but really it's just a really cool hobby that we re really like. And I have one regret regret for uh, my lifetime buck I shot about four or five years ago, and I did not have that shot on film. 
And so I have uh, a son-in-law, Thomas, who's one of the hunting junkies, and Corey, my nephew. And my goal is to help these guys get, uh, you know, Boone and Crockett themselves and this time get it on film for them. Gotcha. All right. Well, it seems like a good purpose. Uh, I mean, we all love the outdoors and, and putting it to film and sounds like your your other profession um, kind of comes hand in hand. So you've got the gear and the setup and kind of understand what it means and how to do it. So that's, that's pretty convenient. Very cool. Very convenient. <laughs> all right. So getting back to the question that I just prompted you with, when does hunting season start for you? It Anymore, it, it truly is 12 months out of the year. There isn't a month or a week or a trip that we don't have something to do and we look forward to it and we love it. Um, you know, now with Rockology, we're on a full 12 month cycle with them. Um, uh, minerals and feed go out, you know, in January and February. Um, uh, we're cultivating the spring food plots, you know, now, uh, we go right through taking care of the food plots, keeping the feed out, keeping the cameras going all summer long. And then we try to get out of the property and leave it alone, you know, before hunting season starts. And then we go right into hunting season and the cycle just continues. Gotcha. All right. So let's, let's talk about food plots for a little while. And obviously we're a fan of food plots. You have more of an advantage, I think, for food plot development than uh, parts of where I am in New Hampshire. But certainly I, 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 I try to dabble in it, but Ohio is just such a, a plentiful place to grow things, right? We, we, we grow a lot of trees. Ohio grows a lot of everything. Um, what, the? how do you, let's break that down. How do you, where do you start with the whole food plot thing? For us, um, we, there's some limitations that we have because our, the property we have, uh, is somewhat, we got 50 acres that we own, but we have access to probably about another 250 acres, but we're surrounded by, you know, like a thousand acres. It's partially in a nature preserve. So it, We don't have like 20,000 acres that we can, you know, point to and look at and say the food plot goes here and we're going to do this. We have to put it where we can put it on a a smaller piece of property. But our mentality is we want to make our little piece of land the most attractive land around to hold the deer. And we're not necessarily thinking we're going to shoot a Boone and Crockett in the food plot, but we know that if we keep the deer herd in our location – Um, especially during the rut, it just lights up and we'll see deer that we've never seen because they're coming to our location because the does have been living there all year. So we just take a little bit more and then we'll kind of hunt around the food plot um, during the rut because, uh, you know, there's just travel corridors. They're going to come by and check those food plots and look, but we're just trying to maintain the health of the herd, keep the deer, you know, in our vicinity, give them a reason to, to come around and really just to keep, the size and mass on all the deer, give the doe some nutrition that they need for the fawns and just do a more conservation approach than thinking we're going to shoot that big buck in the food plot as we're sitting there. Okay. Can you describe your property in, in more detail as far as like uh, timber areas, uh, food plot areas, agriculture, um, the topography, hills, and where things are located relative to like sunrise and sunset and, and how you manage it with both uh, uh, the, the what particular items out of rackology are you using and, and how do you maintain it? All great questions. And that's really where all the work is. The work is not in hunting. That's the easy part. Um, oh, we're in the foothills and we're really part of the Appalachian Mountains. Mm-hmm. And uh, when I first purchased this land, um, I got involved in a forestry program, and the family had logged it uh, maybe four to five years before I purchased it. And I had concerns because it was so thick that we had trouble navigating through the property. And the forest, um, I forget his name, he came out and met me at the property and said he was involved with the uh, logging company that uh, gave the prices to the people that, that owned the land at the time. And he, he was just thrilled to death that we were going to try to manage this for wildlife. Mm. And he went on to start my education on, you know, forestry and wildlife. He said the best thing that this happened to this property is it's, it was logged. He goes, that's why it's so thick here. And there's some nature preserve near us that's never been logged. And it's just tall standing timber with no underbrush as far as you can see. And it doesn't hold really anything. You know, people or animals will go through it, but they won't live there. 
Right, right, right. And so, so we, we kind of embraced how rough our property was and reestablished some old logging trails. And we were able to clear, um, you know, areas out for food plots. But we, we left it and wanted it to be as thick and nasty as it possibly could be. Okay. And instead of it, this is not an open, it's not like Oklahoma where you just see for five miles down a, you know, row of corn. This is very hilly, terrainish. Um, it gives us problems with the wind because the wind swirls. Um, it comes off the hills and, um, you know, the, the thermals are just strange. So, you know, we can check the wind in the morning, look at the weather reports and then in a tree stand that's coming all different directions from us. Mm. Um, but it's so thick, the deer can come from any direction too. So there's good and bad, you know, to that. But um, we've just embraced it being thick and nasty. And the result is the deer can be in really close and you might not know that they're there. Uh, so you can have a heart attack by, you know, just looking, hearing that little click, and you don't know that buck walked in on you from 200 yards away, and he's 20 yards underneath you to your left. Yeah, yep, gotcha. So as far as, like, uh, wind uh, is concerned, like, what's the predominant wind most of the time? Um, probably in our area, it's probably a, a southwestern wind. Okay, all right, gotcha. So as far as setting up your food plots and then tree stand locations relative to – where you're setting your food plots, how do you strategize that? Well, we literally will put um, f- uh, tree stands on both sides of the food plot. Mm. So we can check that wind before we get in the stand, and we'll just get in the stand where, you know, the wind is not blowing across the food plot. Gotcha. All right. So you but, give yourself an option on each food plot, basically. Exactly. Okay. And then we mainly, uh, our success has come from being, you know, w- we like to, keep this hundred yard off the food plot mentality. So we get off the food plot. We try to find the corridors and the travel routes. Um, it, it helps us because a lot of times they come into the food plot at dark. Hmm. So, you know, we know they make their way down the hill, you know, for 45 minutes before they get to the food plot. And then also the bigger bucks just tend to cruise around the food plots and not necessarily stick their nose out in the food plots during daylight. Um, so we spend a lot of time, you know, just off the food plots, not necessarily always on the food plots. Gotcha. And you're using a hundred yards approximately as your as your measure. Yeah, it, it's just a. I, I don't know. Probably because I shot my biggest buck a hundred yards off the food plot. That it's just in the back of my head. I'm like, okay, we're going to make sure that we're always a hundred yards off the food plot. Okay. All right. So if if it's a hundred yards, does that if deer are traveling? I, I mean, obviously, deer can move real fast. But what I've noticed is deer take their time. Right. They they, right. they're, they're lazy by nature and probably a survival mechanism. So, the, you know, there's no rush. Uh, so, and they'll get there when they get there. Um, do you, do you feel like that hundred yard kind of gets you close enough to bedding areas so that they're uh, probably take them an hour to get to the, the food plot from where they are to, but gives you enough daylight at the end of shooting hours to encounter a deer that's making their way towards the, the plots. Yeah, that. That's generally how we think about it. Um, our other issue with bedding areas is we have too many of them because it mm. is so thick. Right. Okay. And, yep. and we know that by uh, being out there in the winter. And, you know, when we either hunt in the winter or maybe we're shed hunting in the winter and we just look around, you see the beds. And it's like, I never knew there were bedding here. But it makes sense because it is so thick, but it's on the edge of a bluff that drops, you know, 30 feet down to a creek. And it gives them that, you know, if the wind's in their face, they got protection in front of them. But they're not. A, it's not a um, traditional bedding area like for some places where they're all bedding over here and they move here to the food. Um, it's just so thick they can bed anywhere and just come into the food plots or go to another food source. So we'll find uh, on a good snow, if we come in 24 hours after the snow, we might find six different places of bedding deer and just one walk through the woods looking for antlers. Okay. Gotcha. How did you decide where to place the food plots after the once you get done clearing, or maybe maybe you decide where the food plot should be, and and then the clearing occurred, and that's where you put them. But how did you how did you decide where all those things should be? For us, it was um, more physical logistics of when we could get equipment in there and how much clearing needed to be done to build a decent food plot. Um, so really, the logistics of the woods and the layout kind of let us know where we could do it and that's where we put them okay so more the topography than anything right right okay all right 
What kind of equipment were you looking to bring in to make this growable uh, so that it sounded like it was really thick, right? It started out thick. So what kind of equipment did you need to make that transition? We've had everything back there from, you know, bulldozers, uh, excavators, backhoes. Um, the most common one we use is a bobcat, and we'll rent that on the weekends. And then for maintenance, we have our own um, uh, pull behind brush hogs and uh, disc systems, but we'll rent that equipment at least once a year. Uh, but in the early on, we had them back there for like two years, just clearing, you know, the different areas and making the different wood piles and putting the trails back in that were there from loggers from years before. But we we had to get big equipment in there because there's no way we could do it with, hmm. you know, by hand, chainsaws, machetes. It was just impossible. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you're doing food plots and all that other stuff, big equipment in thick spots, you have to, right? It's just, you'd be there forever. When you wouldn't get, yeah, you wouldn't they accomplish they, in a lifetime. No, <laughs> right. you learn real quick. It humbles you quickly that you need the big equipment. It, it is, it is daunting when you start to think of how impenetrable, impenetrable nature really is. Right, it you, is. You need some serious stuff. So you you went, you cleared this these plots um, based off of the topography. How did you start to decide what to put in them? Uh, what what from rackology are you using and why? Well, we, we started with uh, really just doing some research online. Um, we were fortunate enough, we found out immediately that our pH was in great shape, and we took measurements everywhere, and we really didn't have to mess with, you know, changing that or bringing in loads of lime like a lot of guys do. It was, it was in the ideal uh, situation. And so then we just went basically to what do we want to provide the deer and we went from thinking we'll put in this particular food plot to now we take more of a smorgasbord opinion of we've got, you know, a brassicus mix on the main plot. We do the clover on another, and then we mix the two on a third. And we think we're very comfortable in saying that we see that the deer are comfortable being away from each other. Mm. And all the deer don't want to go to one place at one time. You know, they have social issues, and we literally see them you know, fighting in the food plots. And now we, if somebody's watching one food plot, we'll have a certain group of does come up to that food plot and a whole different group comes down to a different food plot. So while the the plots aren't that far away from each other, um, we're really liking that we're giving them the different tastes, just like humans when eat different things during the day. We're comfortable in knowing, and we've worked with Jason a lot on this, and he absolutely endorses, you know, giving them different things to eat because they might have different needs at different times in the year, you know, that the different nutrition is going to come through the brassicas and that blend versus the clovers and let the deer tell you what food plot they want to hit at what time. Mm. So we're embracing, you know, making it different as, as we try to develop the property. How many acres is the property that you developed? I own in the area that we hunt, I own 50 acres. Okay. Gotcha. So it's, it's not like this, you know, 10,000 acre plot. It's, it's right. Something that most people could probably figure out. It's, it's manageable for us. Yeah. The people that come to it, they tell us it hunts like, you know, hundreds of acres because it's, it's hilly. You don't see each other. Um, it's thick, you know, it's not like a 50 acre cornfield where everybody sees everybody and you're all standing around. And, and the deer can be running every which different direction, and it's just so thick. You might hear them, but they're 20 yards behind you. Um, so we just love that, it, you know, how thick that it is. Okay. Gotcha. So let's talk about beyond f- food plot development season. I mean, is it, this is the time of year. Are you starting to, to plant now and, and to start the growing season? When, does the, when do you start in Ohio to your planting cycle? Yes, um, we'll we'll do it two times. Uh, we've got two plots in now, and then we'll reestablish the main plot uh, by September first. So we'll replant it, we'll till it, and kill everything at the end of August because we're going to want that growth to carry us through the winter on the main plot. Um, we keep one cl- uh, plot just in clover. Uh, it's the Rockology 365, and that thing just maintains itself. Um, we reseed it as needed, but we don't. We've not had to retill that since we've been using that product, mm-hmm. and it is just thick, full of clover. Okay, and as as far as so you you do a, a primary seeding and growth, and then you 
re, like kill everything off again and reseed it for the to carry you through the winter? Yes. Okay. And what's the purpose of having a, a dual cycle? Um, really, just to carry it through the winter because though we want them to have that main nutrition, there's a lot of competition for food this time of year and going into the summer. So we feel the food plot we want it established because we want them to be comfortable coming to it, but we know they're not counting on it. Okay. In the winter, in January and February, we know that they're counting on it. So we want that plant to start growing, you know, in September and go through that growth phase and, you know, mainly the turnips and radishes that, you know, come into full uh, size in January and February. So they got the carbs when the whole entire woods is shut down, frozen solid, they are then coming into that food plot and it's their main source of uh, nutrition and food during the time that they need it the most. Okay. So you're, you're, it's, so you're kind of like in the, the first round, round one, you're getting them used to the food plot itself, giving them something to chew on. And it's not so much that they need it, but they enjoy it. They probably find some delectable treats there. And then come later, that's when you're saying, okay, now we're going they're going to need to key in on this food source because there's nothing else out there for them to eat right now. And that's the purpose exactly. of your second uh second planting. Got it. Right. Okay. And we see it in the in the trail camera pictures, you know, we have the camera up there now and uh, we'll check the cameras and you know a doe goes by and there's a buck, he's got a little growth on him. Um there's three does at this night but come January 13th when there's four inches of snow on the ground and it's been frozen, you know, 12 degrees for three weeks, we might see 12 shooter bucks in that food plot overnight mm. because it's the only place in town that's, you know, got the the open sign up and, you know, the radishes and turnips are now just sitting there like golf balls and softballs laying around the field. And they're that's what makes us the happiest is that we know they're using that as their main hub and they're getting that nutrition at the time of year when they normally can't get it. Gotcha. Okay. Very interesting. I mean, it's it's kind of taking us through a whole journey that you're on and, you know, what your strategy is to keep keep the deer coming. Well, let's take a little break, and when we come back, we'll pick up where we left off with Joe Godar from the Hunting Junkies. Rackology Deer Supplement and Attractant. Developed through years of intense scientific research comes a product that puts it all in one bag. Superior Attractant. Scientifically formulated vitamins and minerals and all at a much better price. To get yours today, please check out Rackology.org for a list of dealers. Rackology. How can you afford not to use it? Everything deer need all in one bag. And now back to our conversation with Joe Godar from the Hunting Junkies. How often or... When did you start using uh, cameras to start monitoring your herd? Is there, do you do it all year round, or is there a season to that too? Oh, no, yeah, we do it all year round. Uh, we want to see everything. Uh, we want to see them, you know, when they're dropping. Um, nothing, and we haven't been able to control this, but we have a different attitude on it. Um, and Jason has taught us a lot, you know, with his biology background and how much he knows about, you know, deer management. Um, we were always concerned when we'd be hunting in December and January and we'd, we'd find, a we have shot, uh, what we thought was a doe and find out they dropped their antlers mm. and we didn't want to do that, but you know, it, it happens. And so now we understand it's good for those bigger bucks or any buck to drop the antler early because that gives them the longer growth cycle, which means they have the best chance of growing the biggest racks. If they're carrying until, you know, March and April, that growth cycle is a lot shorter and they may not grow as large. So we, we love seeing on camera, you know, what deer are still holding. Um, of course, if they made it through hunting season and, and then we go right back into now where, you know, we're monitoring to see what mineral stations they are hitting, what the racks look like, which deer survived. And then it's fun now seeing as the racks grow, we try to figure out if that was a deer we had on the property last year, you know, it's too early to tell like today, but, you know, we're anxious because we can see this is a mature deer. He's just got four inches of growth. Let's see what he does in two or three weeks when we can start telling what he looks like. Gotcha. Very cool. What, um, I mean, this brings up an interesting point. I mean, can you control through management when the deer that on your property or thereabouts will drop their antlers so that you, you can encourage a higher growth cycle? I have no knowledge of that being... I, I've, everything I've read and, you know, just talking to different people, 
I don't know how you can do that. Uh, you know, it, it has to do with their testosterone levels, uh, the stress that they're under, you know, with food. Um, you know, we try to give them the best food available, but uh, I just don't have any knowledge on how we can control that. Mm. I wish we could. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's an interesting concept, right? If, well, if, if yeah, larger racks same, start early, then let's, let's drop them early. Well, it's the same conversation you get into with how do you get your deer not to be nocturnal? Mm -hmm. And that's, that's just as tough. Cause you know, it's, it's just heartbreaking. Uh, you sit in the woods all day and you may not see anything and you pull the car and you go back to your cabin and you sit down and put it in. And overnight you've got giant bucks running around and you sat there all day during daylight and they were laying down. Right. Um, yeah, it's just uh, our our solution for that is just time in the woods. Just spend as much time out there as you possibly can. Okay, that was my next question. How do you decide when it's time to go? I mean, it, we got all these theories, right? We got moon phases, we got uh, fronts and wind and cold fronts, warm fronts. Uh, you got uh, all, uh, apps that now tell you when you should be out there. Do, do you? Uh, what's your theory? Uh, ours is because we're still just, you know, normal guys that want to go hunting as much as we can. And we all work full time and have families. We go whenever we can. Okay. And it's pretty rare that we won't go because of something. Um, you know, if it's a torrential thunderstorm, we might not go out. Um, but if, if we have a weekend or a time or a date that we can take off and go, we just try to get out there. And then we just try to pick a stand. Uh, if, if we can have a good estimation on when to put something in our favor, uh, we check the cameras to see, you know, what area might be holding them more than others. But we pretty much just go whenever we physically can get out there. Okay. Gotcha. And let's talk about your hunt itself. I mean, what we talked about preparation. You've been doing this all year round, but now, now hunting season is tomorrow. Like it officially starts tomorrow. What's your preparation for the, the day before? What are you thinking? How are you, how are you planning that first hunt? Hopefully we've been shooting our bows a lot. Um, I, I like to try to shoot a few does early in the season because I think it gets rid of a lot of target panic. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, to have a, a mature buck come in front of you and you've not released an arrow yet this year, no matter how many years you've been doing it, uh, I just think there's a lot of, of an advantage to hopefully getting a doe early. So maybe we'll, um, we'll hunt in our local areas where everybody wants to get the does out to try to get a few does. And we got plenty of people that want to meet. And so before we head out to maybe hunt our property, we've tried to, you know, maybe harvest a doe or two. Um, then we just try to make sure our bows are on. We try to shoot as much as we possibly can just for the confidence and, you know, what shots we're going to be taking. Um, obviously, we do all the uh, scent control stuff to all the clothes. We make sure all that inventory is done and sealed in our bags. And we go out and try to get out there as early as we can. Okay. What are you shooting for equipment? Um, and when you say you practice a lot, what is a lot? We have a, a little mini range next to our cabin. So we just have like little, um, well, I guess little contests between ourselves like all summer. So when we go out, like now, we take our bows with us and, um, you know, we'll just maybe make a little bet or just egg each other on to just so we can be shooting and shooting and shooting. Um, we do try uh, as much as we can to take like few shots, but do it very often, like grab our bows, go over and take one shot, put the bow down, go do something else, go back over, take one shot, see who's get the best shot, put it down. Because then I, I believe that that practice is much better than standing there and shooting 25 arrows because mm -hmm. the first arrow is the only one that matters. Okay. I've, I've heard multiple theories on that, like shoot one or two arrows at a time and then go take a break and come back later or, yep. but it, yeah, it's, I believe in it totally. Okay. All right. What, um, when you are shooting, what are you shooting at? Like, are you, are you using a Glendale box? Or are you using some kind of a stationary uh, archery target? We, we literally have a little bit of everything. We have um, some bags that we hang at our cabin. Um, we have some blocks that we carry in the back of the truck. So when we're around town here, we'll go over each other's house on a you know, Thursday night, and we'll just put the block in the backyard and mm -hmm. take some shots there. Um, we don't have any, like, Glendale bucks anymore. Uh, we used to use them a lot, um, but just transporting them and moving around became much more difficult than just grabbing a block or hanging a bag, you know, next to the cabin. Yep. Yep. That makes sense. As far as shooting, um, field tips versus broadheads, um, what do you do there? How do you decide, do you, 
do you practice with your broadheads or you just slide them in and hope for the best or how do you strategize all that stuff? I just shoot uh, field points all year and I, I just stay with a hundred grain field point and a hundred grain broadheads. And then literally the day before the first time we go out, I'll put my broadheads on what I feel are my, you know, four or five best arrows that I've been practicing with. And then I'll shoot them one time. Okay. And then I leave them in my quiver the rest of the year. And then I just practice with field tips uh, during the season. Okay. So you're actually using arrows that you practice with during the year? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I, 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 to me, it's a challenge to figure out, like, I'll buy new arrows every year. And then I'm going to figure out the top three just from my flight and my practicing. And then I'll, I'll set them aside maybe midpoint during the year. Because once I figure out these three are flying really well, then I, I don't want them to get messed up during target practice. Okay. And how do you define what's flying well and what's not, and how do you how do you mark them? Um, you know, I, I want to, you know, hit a quarter with three of them at 25 yards. And if I'm off, I, I'm going to find out if it's me or if it's the arrow or the fletching. And as I get older, 90% of the time it's me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because it's just... <laughs> I'm with you. <laughs> different and you know things don't move the same um but i i'm a firm believer in the arrow and the fletching are different on almost each arrow and it's going to fly differently you know through each bow i mean if you're going to talk about like getting it down to a, a science we try to um we have a guy sean on our team that is the most phenomenal bow tech guy out there mm. um he works at cabela's uh, he's just a great friend and he makes sure that we're paper tuned and dialed in so he He's always blaming us. He's not blaming the equipment. Right. And so he's he's a huge benefit. And but you know you got to take into consideration each arrow's got glue on a fletching that each you know any little change is going to make that arrow fly differently. And that's when I'll just pick the three arrows that just and they always stand out immediately after I practice for a while. There's just three arrows that I always know that fly really well, and those are the ones I grab. Gotcha. And you just set them aside. No uh, no special mark. Just all right. That one. Seems to be right. flying the best. And set that aside. Yeah, then they kind of go in the the quiver instead of the practice quiver. They go in the hunting quiver, and gotcha. that's, then I'm set for the season until I break one or you know shoot at somebody, and I got to replace him. Gotcha. And what do you what are you shooting for arrows? Uh, Carbon Express. Okay. All right. Gotcha. All right. Let's uh let's get into a a memorable hunt if we could. Uh, we ask every guest to share a, a hunt and kind of bring it all together from both you know, you're on your property, your your gear, your setup, your food plots, strategize, all that stuff. Maybe you got one of those. Um, where are we heading on this hunt? Well, this one is out of our property for sure. Um, I had hunted this property before I bought it for years, and I had seen, you know, I, I told people this a buck that I saw out there was a 300-class deer. And the the short story on that is I, we were out hunting the rut with uh, two of my other friends. In the morning, the guy farthest away from us at the back of the property shot an eight-pointer and wanted us. He said he for sure got it. He got down, couldn't find it. He wants help blood tracking. And my other friend and I were in, hunting the same ridge, and we had both seen shooter you know, bucks all morning just chasing and running. So I was a little resistant to get out and go help him track you know halfway across the other side of the property and i told him let's let's just wait well my friend said i'm going let's go with me we're going to spend one hour from 12 to 1 looking we're going to get back in our tree stands we couldn't find it um we decided to get back in our tree stands i come walking back down the trail left my climber on a tree and i got back put my feet in the climber i'm going up i'm about eight feet up and about 10 feet in front of me to my left a deer that had been bedded down stood up Hmm. and my first opinion was, that's a horse's butt. What is a horse doing back in these woods? <laughs> that's the first thing that hit me is like, there's a horse standing there. And with that, the deer, you know, swung his head from one side to the other and looked behind him, which was looking at me. And then I saw the rack and he, no, no kidding. He, he just looked like an elk and he just walked away. Mm. So he walked in there and bedded down while I was out looking, you know, to help my buddy find the, the deer that he shot that we did not find right um that got me going more you know to, to have an encounter like that was it, it was just mind-boggling when if you're a hunter or fisherman and you have an encounter like that it sold me i mean i was like i've got to get a 
large buck one of these days in my life. Yeah. And so that kind of made me crazy to get this property developed. Um, that's I recently purchased part of the property and just put everything I can into it to make it better. And years went by. And I remember my wife saying, you know, why do you take so many people out there hunting? You keep talking about you want to get a big buck. What if they shoot a big buck? I'm like, that'd be great. Just somebody. I want it. And by big buck, I mean, you know, a really big buck. Yeah. Um, 200. Rocket, over 200. Yeah. 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 And then another uh, encounter I had, um, I don't know how big he was, uh, but dogs were chasing him. And he just ran right through the property, ran right underneath me at 10 yards, going 50 miles an hour, and away he went. Hmm. Um, and then lo and behold, one day in 2012 during the rut, I just, this, the thing I, I think that more hunters could really do well with is all day sits because so many of the times I've encountered the very, very large deer are, you know, 12 o'clock, one o'clock, two o'clock in the middle of the afternoon, 60 right. degrees in November, but you stay in your stand all day. Right. And I had made the commitment to do that and it, it got so warm on this November uh, ninth day, I think it was 2012. Um, I did not see one deer all morning and I stood up and I'm like, I'm going to eat my sandwich and I'm going to take one layer of clothing off and I'm going to sit back down. And the minute I sat down and put the bow in my hand, this buck came up to my left and we had had this deer on camera previously, Mm -hmm. but the pictures were so bad. I couldn't tell what it was. Gotcha. And I, I went back over the, you know, after this and found him and I'm like, that has to be him, and that has to be him. But there was not a clear enough picture to even tell exactly what he was. Yeah. And I had the wind with me that day with where he was coming from out of a draw up onto a logging trail. He was at 20 yards, and I was in perfect position. Shot him, made a perfect shot, uh, quartering away. He reared back like I've never seen a deer ever. He was up on his hind legs like a spronking stallion, huh. making grunts and noises like I've never heard of, and I was like in shock. Huh. And he, he went down on the ground and did a circle like a break dancer yep, yep, and yep. blood was everywhere. And I'm just like, I, I thought, should I shoot him again? And I'm like, no, he's going to die right here. And he gets up and he goes down the way he came and he performs this break dance like three times going down this hill. Hmm. And then I hear this giant yelp and scream and holler at the bottom of the draw, which I can't see, but I know where he is. And then dead silence. Hmm. And my, buddy that was hunting with me that day i texted him he came up and about an hour after that we waited i went down there he was gone couldn't find him Hmm. and we did everything we searched um at the time i didn't have a blood tracking dog but i do now for that reason and we called every shop in town looking for dog tracking and at five o'clock before it was getting dark i just told him i'm going to walk around the entire property and just take a walk on the logging trail just to see what i can find i get about half a mile to three quarters of a mile away from where I shot him, I decided to take a right and go back to him to get on the ATV, and he was laying dead at the crossroads of uh, two trails. Wow. Three quarters of a mile from where I shot him. Wow. <laughs> three quarters of a mile. He Yeah, and the blood stopped. Um, he had such a tough brisket. Even the, uh, the taxidermist was like, what was up with that deer? I physically could not get my knife into him. Huh. I mean... And the arrow went in, you know, quartering away, and it broken off and got probably six to eight inches in there. So I think I penetrated at least one lung, but it just covered up. So the initial blood stopped, and he just started walking up this hill and went away, and we, we just lost blood after 100 yards. Mm. And that was my deer of a lifetime. He went uh, 223 gross, and wow. um, he's a Boone Crockett hanging on the wall. Just the, one of those big, like you said, big horse bucks, man. Those things are just yeah. big and brutal and st- tough as nails. And and sometimes those bucks live with with those shots, and you just can't figure it out. Uh, and look how far he went. It's insane. Yeah. And my friend, Don, that was with me, he had seen the buck coming up a, a creek, and mm. it was kind of heading in his direction. Mm. And I had rattled when I ate my sandwich and everything before I sat down. Yep. And he said that deer physically turned around and went my direction. So mm. I, I'm confident I rattled him in. Yeah, yeah. But Don got to stare at him for a half hour. I did not. And when he knew that I shot that deer, he's like, there, there is no way you've... Because I didn't get a chance to look at the antlers. I mean, he came through this thicket. I'm like, it's a shooter. Grabbed my bow, shot him, and it was over. Hmm. 
and he studied him. He's like, dude, that thing has got more points. I don't know how many it has. We, we got to find it. So he's texting all of our friends, telling everybody I shot this big deer, and here I'm in total disbelief, not even knowing if we're going to find this deer. Right. And and I didn't want to be the guy to tell the story about the one that got away. Right. I just, you know, it was four hours of total desperation <laughs> right. looking for him. Wow. And then finally getting him. Um, yeah, like I said, my only regret is I d- we had filmed some hunts back then, but not as much as we're doing now. And that was my only regret is I did not catch that on film. Right, right. Wow, what a great story. Very cool, Joe. Let me uh, hit you with 10 rapid-fire questions here. I'm ready. All right, what's your number one hunting tip of all time? Stay all day. Stay Hunt dust to dawn, 12 hours. Very nice. What's the one thing that you can't hunt without? Probably one of those things you leave in the truck and it drives you crazy if you don't have it with you. Well, obviously my my release, but also my bleak can. Bleak can, okay. What's your big, biggest pet peeve in life? All that people think hunters are out there killing deer and they don't understand what a true conservation effort is. That's a good one. I really like that. Uh, how old are you today? I'm 56. 56. What would you tell the 22-year-old Joe Godard, knowing what you know today about life? Oh, that's a great question. Um, just do more of what you love. Spend more time with your family and friends and don't work so much. Nice. All right. You're at a hunting convention somewhere in the world. A stranger comes up to you and asks you what you do for a living. What would you tell them? Um, technically, I'm in vacation rental marketing. Okay. All right. Very cool. What did you have for breakfast this morning? A protein shake. Nice. You get your own billboard on the side of a highway. It's a blank canvas. You can put anything you want on it. What would it say? <laughs> <laughs> These are pretty random, aren't they? They are random. Um, Come on, Joe. You're in marketing. Yeah. That, I, I just got to decide which one I'm going to go with this one. Uh, I'm just thinking the word relax. I like that. That's a good one. But if I say the word successful to you, who's the first person that pops in your head and why? Um, I got about three family members of uh, my father's generation and just spending time with him, you know, listening to him at Christmas telling stories. And it's it's not the money success. It's that everybody wanted to be around them. And um, they just always were telling the not the, their stories, but they knew a everything about everybody else. So the success to me was that they supported everybody else around them and made everybody else feel better about being around them. That's cool. That's, that is cool. What's a typical day in your life look like? Um, try to get to the gym in the morning, um, work on the computer too many hours a day. And if it's not hunting season, like now I'll get out and uh, maybe play on our adult baseball team. And then on the week I get out to our cabin and enjoy that. Very nice. And then finally, what's a deer hunting day in your life look like? Oh, that that's just burned in my brain that, you know, we get up at 4 or 4.30 in the morning. We have our coffee. Uh, we get our showers. We get, get all of our scent control stuff going. We take turns making sure we got all the right uh, gear for that day. We get the, uh, we got electric carts out. Um, we head back into the woods. And um, now I got, uh, you know, one of my favorite animals in my life is my a five-year-old Doberman that I've trained for deer tracking, and she has found some deer that we thought were never going to be found, so she's mm. always with us. The um, the only downside there is now we have to take turns to come back, so we can't all stay out in the woods for 12 hours at a time. Right, right. So we, we'll, like, draw straws or who's coming back for Andy, and and then um, the rest of us try to stay out all day, and, and we, we just make it a point to be in the woods as long as we can. Yeah, uh, makes sense. That's cool. I, I'm a big fan of tracking dogs when help you find the deer. It makes it um, makes that recovery um, a little easier because they're so much better at it than we are, and it just makes you feel good that you didn't let a deer go unrecovered uh, most of the time. That's pretty cool. Yeah, she she has taught me more than I've taught her. They they yes. know what they're doing, and yep. once they get that idea of I'm going to go find a deer, you just got to let them work. And uh, yeah, to I don't want you know, Corey or Thomas or any of the guys we hunt with now to, to have a situation like I was in and maybe not find a, a deer of that quality or any deer really, cause it's just not right to not find them. Right. And she just does an unbelievable job. So we won't go out without her. That is awesome. Very good. Well, if we have uh, created more questions than answers, as we sometimes do on a podcast, <laughs> um, where can we find more information about you and how can people reach out to you? Well, uh, we do have a website now. It's huntingjunkie.com. Uh, 
We have our bios up there. Uh, we've got our hunt giveaway this year uh, that's sponsored by Rockology and ASAT. Uh, you can contact us directly through there, and we'd love to hear from you. Awesome. Joe, this has been a pleasure and an honor to have you on the show, and uh, hopefully we can do it again sometime. Yeah. Jay, thanks for having us. I appreciate it. I appreciate Joe coming on the show and kind of going through his story. You know, we observe through social media these these guys and gals that are making an influence on the hunting industry, and uh, many of them are of interest. Uh, we'd like to explore each and every one of them to see kind of what makes them tick, what got them into the hunting industry, who were their mentors, what kind of stories can they add, what, what kind of techniques are they using to help their hunting situations. Maybe there's a situation out there that's similar to theirs that can help you out, so we'd like to pass along that information. Dusty, where can we find you when you're not hanging out here in the studios with me? Uh, shoot me an email, dusty at bigbuckregistry.com. You can look me up on Instagram and Twitter at Chasing Antler, facebook.com forward slash chubby tines outdoors. Jay, where can the people reach out to you when you're not on the mic? Likewise, you can shoot me an email, jay at bigbuckregistry.com, and you can visit us on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash bigbuckregistry. We're also on Twitter, which is twitter.com forward slash bigbuckregistry. We are also on Instagram, instagram.com forward slash bigbuckregistry, and YouTube, which is youtube.com forward slash bigbuckregistry. On YouTube, you can listen to all of our podcasts in their entirety. As far as videos are concerned, it's a boring video, but the audio content is there, so you can actually listen to our podcast. You can also listen to all of our live shows that we've done on Thursday nights when we do do them, and we've gone back and interviewed, re-interviewed a lot of our previous guests we had on the show just to put a face to a voice, let's put it that way. You can always listen to our show on other places as well, not just YouTube. We're found on Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Google Play, and as an Amazon Alexa skill, go to Alexa and say, Alexa, enable Big Buck Registry. And if you would like to submit a buck to our page for consideration and be featured on our page in front of 250,000 diehard deer hunting fans, all you have to do is go to bigbuckregistry.com forward slash my buck and all of the instructions will be right there. I think that's pretty much everywhere we're at. I think that's a wrap, Dusty. That's a whole lot of Big Buck, Jay. Sure is. I'm Jay Scott. I'm Dusty Phillips. And this is the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. We'll see you next week. <laughs>